Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for making it out to the end of the uh, second charrette process. Uh, I want to go ahead and thank our uh, consultants uh, this evening for leading us through a second week of the charrettes. Uh, we have Dan Parolek here to speak uh, regarding the design aspect of it, um, Ben Sigman regarding the economics, and uh, Patrick Sigman regarding the uh, traffic management plan. Um, very pleased that we have a few of our council members, uh, as well as myself, out here this evening. We have Vice Mayor Sinks, um, Council Member Chang, and I did see Council Member Scharf here, uh, and he's uh, he's in, uh, uh, present at uh, uh, at at this time. So thank you very much for uh, the support. Um, you know, it's been a really great process. I, I know that the expectation was that the Dubs would sweep uh, the Western Conference Finals and not be playing right now. <laughs> Um, but, uh, of course, we do have this archived. And so, um, you know, thank you for sticking with us. I know this is a pretty difficult time of the year. Uh, we only have about a week left until the end of school. Um, we've been through a lot as a community. Uh, times are, are generally very good. Um, and I think that there's quite a bit going on throughout, um, you know, everyone's lives at this point. Uh, but, of course, sticking through this kind of a process um, means that uh, we listen to all these various perspectives and understand uh, where the pressure points are coming from, where the opportunities are, um, and of course, where our uh, various uh, prospects uh, lie as well. We seem to have a, a good parallel track right now. Uh, there's a state-driven SB35 project uh, at the same time that we have this. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's a very interesting time, development-wise. I'm sure when they write the history books in uh, several hundred years regarding this time, they'll have a couple of chapters uh, regarding land use and various mechanisms. Um, but in, in any event, um, you know, I, I think without uh, belaboring the point, uh, we've done quite a bit. Uh, and I think that this has been, uh, at the very least, an educational process, and it's been very thorough. Uh, why don't we give a big round of applause for our consultants for bringing forward this um, very, very thorough process um, in the last uh, several months to us. Uh, we do have a few more months to go after this, uh, but of course we want to wrap up this second design phase of charrette number two. And so without further ado, I give you Dan Perlick. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight. I, I, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this, but I do just feel it's been a really good uh, part of this process to establish the ground rules uh, before each of the meetings. And I think I'll just, I'm not gonna read through the points, but I just wanna encourage everybody, and I feel that everybody's been really good about this, of just being respectful of one another, uh, be respectful of one another's opinions, and, and um, let's just continue to have some, some good conversations about uh, this, uh, the Velco special, special Area Specific Plan as it moves forward. So um, many of you look very familiar in terms of being here f both over the course of the first charrette, but, but more specifically at the Monday evening kickoff. But I, I do want to um, just reinforce um, where the process has gone over the course of this week and, and where it's going. And the first charrette um, and many of the drawings that are up here in the front corner to your left are actually from the first charrette. It was really focused on um, us investigating and testing different alternatives, different frame, street frameworks, different public space, space types, different massing, different sizes, bu buildings in different locations. And um, basically that enabled us to build a really solid foundation uh, moving, coming into Charette to, to be thinking about what were the shared uh, good characteristics of each of those different alternatives that we ultimately want to be thinking about integrating those ideas and reinforcing those ideas in the specific plan document and the new zoning uh, in the new form-based code for the document. So the over the course of this week, most of the drawings you'll see that we produced this week were about what will it take to create a document and new zoning that can predictably implement uh, the community's vision for the, the Velco uh, specific plan area. And so that's been the focus of the week. So the drawings tend to be a little bit more technical. Uh, they might start looking a little bit more like uh, zoning documents. Um, and so we appreciate you continuing to participate in the process uh, over the course of this week. 
And I wanted to start off uh, by talking a little bit about the program parameters and talk about the program, the different ranges of programs that we've looked at. And um, this is a slide I, I presented on Monday again, but I just thought it was really important to reinforce where we were at during Charette 1, at the end of Charette 1, what we heard sort of at the, toward the tail end of Charette 1 in between, sort of how we adapted that coming into Charette 2. So you can see on this table at the end of the Charette, um, in terms of retail and entertainment program, it was typically, generally the alternatives we were studying were in the low 400,000 square foot range. Uh, the office was ranging between 1.3 and 2 million square feet. Um, the housing was, in most of the scenarios, was, were at 2,400 units. Um, and then the civic uses were between 45 and 65,000 square feet. And that, that included a, a city hall program and some of the incubator programs that had been talked about. So we <clears throat> realized um, that, you know, we, we got a lot of comments back at the, at the end of the shred in particular, at the final presentation about, uh, number one, why weren't you studying more retail? And number two, why weren't you studying a lower office program? And so we have the benefit of having Ben and his economics team on board to give us the ability to say, okay, well, how much can we dial up that retail entertainment program and how much can we dial down that office program and still, uh, being pro still propose a viable program uh, mix and sort of different, right? All of those different programs sort of dial up and dial down based on the assessment of the, the economics of the program. So. Uh, coming into Charette 2, and I'll say that we haven't changed uh, this, these program ranges since Monday, and we're really working within these, is that um, the retail and entertainment program, sort of we bumped the upper end of that up to the 600,000 square foot uh, mark. Um, then we started, uh, sort of we lowered the office, the lower end of the office to about 750,000 square feet uh, to look at sort of the viability and the impact on the physical form. Of, of that alternative, and what happened as our team was looking at that was that it necessitated actually looking at a higher number of residential units to, to make up for the gap in the economics of, of, of dialing up and dialing down those, those two previous programs. Then we held fairly consistent that civic program um, within the program, and so um, once again, over the course of this week, we were working within that same range um, that we adapted at the beginning of the Charette 2 that I presented on Monday. Um, uh, we do want to acknowledge that one of the biggest concerns that we've heard from the very beginning of this process was the community's concern about a project like this causing overcrowding in the schools. And it's an extremely valid concern, um, so we wanted to sort of dig deeper into this. Um, we were extremely fortunate, if, if many of you maybe had a chance to, to, to come to it on Tuesday, uh, Polly Bove, and, uh, who's the, the superintendent of the Fremont Union High School District, and their, their demographer, Tom Williams, um, actually came and gave a really great presentation on Tuesday. And it's available on the, the, the envisionvelco.org website. I encourage you to, to watch that if you didn't get a chance to to participate in that. There was a lot of good conversation in Q&A, and what's, what's really great about what came out of that conversation and, and previous conversations with the different school districts is that um, they're not worried about overcrowding. Their two biggest concerns are actually loss in student population, and their number one concern is the fact that they cannot retain the best teachers because they can no longer afford to live in, in, in the, your community as well as surrounding communities. So those are their two biggest concerns. So, I encourage you to, to, to watch that um, presentation, that conversation, if you didn't get a chance to do it on Tuesday. And a couple of slides that I showed on Monday that I just wanted to reinforce is that um, knowing that there's concern about sort of even that upper end of the 600,000 square foot of retail from some community members, uh, we feel very confident based on our experience um, and sort of what we've seen happening across the country that you can achieve the goal that you've established in your general plan of creating a vibrant retail environment with 400 to 600,000 square feet of retail and entertainment. It's enough to create a real destination, it's to, enough to create a vibrant place and to create that downtown that you established as a policy within your general plan. Um, the other thing is that um, we just wanna reinforce that it really is the office component that uh, sort of makes the project the most economically viable. It's the piece that delivers the highest returns for the developer. 
And, but at the same time, um, we also want to emphasize that a mix of office is a really great component to have for a vibrant and viable downtown environment. Because what you have is you have, number one, there's going to be a certain percentage of people that live and work in the downtown, thus reducing your traffic. Those people that are working in the offices spaces during the day are going to sort of spill down and, and support those businesses, in particular the restaurants during the day when, the, when others are off at work and not able to support those businesses. And the other point that I wanted to make about office is we've actually had, had some really great conversations with various community members about wanting to think creatively within that really broad definition of office about what sorts of services and amenities a community like yours would need and want that could fit within that classification. You know, as every community has the challenge, well, challenge of the issue with their aging populations, a lot of those people are looking to move into uh, neighborhoods that are actually walkable or they don't rely on a car. So they need medical services and amenities to support uh, themselves within their neighborhood. So, so we've had some great conversations. We're still trying to figure out how to uh, effectively integrate that concept into the specific plan, but it's something that will be on our radar as we continue to move forward. Um, once again, this is a, a slide from, from Monday, but we just want to continue to reinforce this, is that housing is obviously a really important part of the program and the conversation. Um, we really like some of the ideas that came out of the community about some creative housing types, um, in, ter in terms of co-housing potentially, maybe even senior-focused co-housing. Um, if you're not aware, I know in, in Seattle in particular, there's been a couple of really great three- and four-story vertical mixed-use co-housing projects where a group of 15 baby boomer friends got together and actually developed a co-housing project. And um, the opportunities here would be a little bit different, but it's just interesting to be thinking about those creative uh, formats of housing as we move forward. And then obviously affordability um, is a big topic of conversation. And we keep hearing from various community members that it's not necessarily just affordability at the lower end of the spectrum. Um, there's, there's also, which is a problem everywhere in the Bay Area in particular, that they're, they're the middle income families that can't get qualify for subsidized housing and they don't have enough to, to pay the market rate. So we need to be thinking about that middle income house, these middle income households as well as we're moving forward with this. Um, had a great conversation today with Andrew from the Chamber of Commerce. He dropped in today. I actually grabbed a couple of his slides um, from what he was showing me. They're apparently doing some work related to housing. Um, and he was just, he had his staff looking at um, uh, Zillow and right, the average, the median home value in Cupertino is $2.1 million, which means the more monthly mortgage would be almost $11,000 a month, which means you have to have a household income of $450,000 to even afford that that house. So that's, I mean, I knew these numbers were high, but just seeing those again, and I wanted to show them again, like this is, this is pretty extreme. Um, and one other slide from him where they started to break down typical salaries by job type and how many houses are available in this, this specific zip code in Cupertino to that house range. And so what you can see on this is you have to go up to um, a salary range of over $300,000 um, it's the double income for an engineer, two, two engineers living in a household. Um, and there's only five homes in this Cupertino zip code available at that price point. And at the higher price point, at that 450,000 price point, once again, there's only seven homes available. So you guys, you know, there's, you know, you guys are grappling with the similar problems in many other uh, Bay Area communities, but these, this is, this is really extreme. So, um, just wanted to continue to pull forward this idea of the innovation hub because it was a, as a, as a program idea that came from various uh, different groups and community members. So we're gonna continue to, to discuss that, uh, sort of work with the city staff and try to figure out some more of the details related to that. I do wanna note that this is one of those program categories that fits into that public benefit. So this is a type of program that, um, as we're thinking about putting this into the program and the specific plan, it's the type of program that would likely be a, a, a money loser for the developer, so we just need to think about what those impacts would be, even though you know, it's a, it's a, it'd be a great amenity for the community. 
Um, I didn't have this in my slides on Monday, and we got, we got reminded this by several people. Um, we had showed a performing arts theater in, I think, both of the alternatives that we, we created at uh, in the first charrette, so we just wanted to bring that back into the conversation as a potential program, programming idea. Um, the, the Mountain View Center for Performing Arts. Um, how many of you have actually been to this, this theater? It's, it's a really great venue. I just, want, just wanted to give you a sense, it's about 40, square, 41,000 square feet. So we're gonna start thinking about what that might mean in terms of being on that list of potential public benefits for the project. And the really great thing about, and this is proven in Mountain View, is it's a great, has great synergy with the City Hall as well, that City Hall program that we've been talking about. Because in Mountain View, they sit side by side across a really great plaza space. So uh, that's, that's on the table for consideration. And so back to this idea of how are we going to regulate for this high quality predictable implementation of a vision. And so the first piece of that gets back to this notion that we understand that uh, public space, uh, the amount of public space and the quality of public space is really important to you as a community. And it's obviously really important to us in terms of this ultimate success of a mixed use downtown environment. And so we were looking at different patterns of public spaces that in combination can create a really great environment and reinforce that environment. And I just wanna mention, once again, part of this, this second charrette is we're, we're just simply reinforcing that there's not one, per, there's, we're not proposing one perfect solution, but we're saying that within a set of shared parameters and regulations, there's multiple ways to achieve the same goal. And this goal is sort of defined in your specific plan of creating this mixed use downtown center. And, um, once again, the shared slide for Monday, but I want to reinforce this. Um, we understand, well, we just want to make a point, is that amount of op public space, open space, park space is important to the community. It's going to be impossible to get to 30 acres of open space without the large green roof. I'll just, I mean, I just want to be really upfront in saying that. Um, but we do feel that in all these alternatives that we studied, that we're getting a really good amount of high quality mix of different types and sizes of public spaces that's appropriate to support and create a vibrant downtown environment. So I just wanna reinforce that. And we're, we're definitely not against sort of individual buildings having gr their green roofs. It's, it's, it's actually not, it's a great sustainability goal to have. So it's just a, it's a great conversation to continue to have as we move forward in this process. Um, once again, I just wanted to show you, and these are up on the walls, is we studied various alternatives where the, the town square sh changed shape, it changed location, and it changed um, in size a little bit. Um, but what we've decided is that it makes complete sense to actually say that the main town square needs to happen on the west side of Wolf North Wolf Road, but there's a large range of locations that it could happen based on how the developer and their design team chooses to come up with this solution. So as we looked at these alternatives, we actually look at examples, other public space examples. We think about how they function, we think about how they've evolved over time, and we think about their sizes. And so to, just to give you a couple of examples, for example, the Healdsburg Town Square. Uh, it's about 200 by 280 feet little about 1.3 acres just for sense of size and right that's a pretty good sort of prototypical example of a, a good town square size so just as you're as you're looking at and there's just a series of other examples here that you can look at the Portland uh, Pioneer Square is about 230 by 230 about 1.2 acres so that's just a really good reference point as you're looking at some of these examples on the wall and thinking about sizes of the main town square as well as the overall size of of that public space within the alternatives. So we'll, within the specific plan and with the, within the code, we'll be actually be defining a range of public space types, defining their characteristics and giving parameters like what are the minimum sizes, what sorts of activities should they be, be programmed with. So you'll start to see that information as we um, start to dive into the specific plan in the form-based code. The other thing we realized as we were studying these alternatives of the public space framework is that it could be actually a very interesting idea. It came up from various community members to build a pedestrian connection uh, in, in, the, in the terms of a bridge across 
to, to span the east and west sides of North Wolf Road. Uh, we don't think it should be a requirement, but if the, the developer and their, their design team wants to come in and create that sort of iconic connection across North, North Wolf Road, we actually think it could be a really interesting element um, to the project program. Um, so the, the current regulations would require about 13 acres of park space if you have a 2,400 unit program. Um, through this, the series of testing these different alternatives, uh, the, the, these alternatives are basically showing that you can get about six to seven acres of at-grade uh, public space, high-quality public space in most of the alternatives. And so we would, within the specific plan, set a threshold at which the developer needs to provide that level of on-site public space, and then they'd be able to actually pay an in-lieu fee for the remaining amount that would go to improving park spaces in the surrounding neighborhoods. So I just wanted to, to mention that as a, as a concept. And once again, right, this can, this, this town square can take a number of different formats. We had different reactions to this drawing um, that was produced at the first charrette, but one of many different ways that you could create a, a high quality, vibrant town center and town square within the project area. Types, other types of elements that we're thinking about is just the, the quality and type of space that's being provided, uh, types of programming that's happening within those spaces, and then different ways to differentiate and create um, interest within those spaces, like a really large custom piece of public art could do it. Um, you could have a, a band shell and an amphitheater to do that, and there's you know, millions of other ways you can program that space and differentiate it and, and make it a true destination. Um, uh, with, within the region, not only within Cupertino. So the next piece here is just diving into some of the other elements that we're gonna be thinking about how to regulate in terms of trying to create predictability for that vibrant, walkable environment. Um, the first are streets. And streets, and Patrick uh, Sigmund's gonna talk a little bit more about street design in a little bit, but I just wanted to mention that there are gonna be specific street locations and designs that will be required in the specific plan. And there are gonna be others that are optional. Um, and so right now, there are certain uh, recommendations for North Wolf Road and sort of how the buildings and the new project will interface with, with uh, that uh, context, uh, Stevens Creek, um, and then the Perimeter Road coming into the project. And we're, we're actually recommending that that southern portion of Perimeter Road as it meets Stevens Creek is a, is a piece that's actually required. And then how it works its way through the project area can be up to the, the developer and their design team. Um, we're providing flexibility. You see the gray streets on this diagram is just a, gen, a typical street and block framework that we would um, uh, require within the project area and how that would be required rather than saying this is exactly where the streets would go. We're actually gonna say the maximum length of any block is about 500 to 550 feet in length. And then the second thing is the maximum perimeter of a block, we typically regulate to about 1400 feet and those numbers may adjust up and down a little bit, but then you don't have to require specifically where the streets go, but you make sure that you have a walkable pattern when the project gets designed and built out. Just a really important piece of, of the, the walkability. And then so you put the public spaces and the street framework together and you, you create a really great a vibrant, walkable, mixed-use environment. So the other sorts of things that we think about uh, related to sort of in, ensuring a predictable, vibrant uh, public realm. Um, in blue here is just thinking very carefully about the way that the buildings interface with the, it's, it seems very straightforward, but it's a piece that if you don't regulate very carefully that a lot of times um, architects will get wrong. Um, and um, so we're thinking about, we call it frontage. You'll hear this term over and over again. It's about how that building interfaces with the sidewalk or what we call the public realm. And so we'll basically be saying that a per certain percentage of that ground floor must be transparent. We may say there need to be entries. There's maximum distance between entries so that you don't get an entire 550 foot long block with one door on it. It creates a very dead environment. Um, we, you know, we, we studied sort of a single story shop front environment and we know there's a, a real opportunity here and possibility that there's probably gonna be double, multiple stories of retail. So we're thinking about how do you effectively regulate that quality interface at, at one story, two stories, and maybe even uh, above and beyond that. Um, then we just think very carefully about, right, spaces, how do the, side, how do the sidewalks function? This seems very basic but having a sidewalk that's a foot too narrow 
makes it somewhat dysfunctional. So we need to think very carefully about that, the spaces where people window shop to support those businesses, and then that transition between the sidewalk and where the, the vehicles are within the project area. So then the, the next piece are our initial thoughts on um, allowed heights and uses. And so uh, this is just a very simple diagram that shows um, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about that transition to the, the western, the neighborhood to the west. Um, but what we're thinking right now is the heights start at about 35 feet at that western edge. There's a zone that, in which they jump up to 55 feet. And then within the rest of that, the western project area and the northeastern project area, that there's a base height of 85 feet that can go up to 120 if the developer meets certain public benefit. Um, sort of requirements. And um, so, so that's, that's where our thoughts are right now with the, the height parameters. Um, and this is just a, a really simple section showing a, a very thoughtful uh, sort of that, that western edge and the wall and the perimeter road that exists along there and how those different heights um, sort of relate to that existing western edge. And so um, we're just giving a lot of really careful thought to this. I just wanted to sort of, this is our first draft, our first pass at this, um, and just uh, want to continue to keep that on our radar. I do want to mention that um, as we're sort of working back and forth with the property owner and just thinking about the opportunities to achieve, the, especially the upper thresholds of the housing on the site, we are thinking about if there's the need for buildings to go taller, and right now 160 foot in height is the tallest that the EIR is studying, um, we feel that these locations are the locations that make the most sense. In particular, the area right where Valco Parkway meets North Wolf Road, um, and then in the, the northeastern corner of the project area as you get closer to the, the new hotel and the new freeway. Um, so, uh, and basically um, that 160 foot height threshold will is sort of on the table if it needs to, to uh, if it becomes necessary for, for the, the, the negotiations with the developer in terms of what public benefits are being um, negotiated as part of the project. And this is just a quick illustration at that North Wolf Road and Velco Parkway intersection showing uh, 160 foot tall buildings at three of those corners. Actually it could be a, create a very iconic um, sort of intersection and entry in and of itself, um, uh, especially with some, some high quality architecture. Um, there are two ways to approach these towers. And um, uh, basically one way is to just let the tower, I mean you can provide horizontal articulation and let it kind of go unbroken up to that 160 foot feet in height. Or we can think about after the sixth floor, approximately the sixth floor, we require the building to step back a certain amount of feet and then it goes up so it, it, it delivers a, a ground level podium of sorts uh, for those buildings. So we're thinking about both of those alternatives um, in terms of uh, those potential long-term buildings and then in terms of allowed uses. Um, the, generally speaking, this is, this is actually pretty straightforward. We're looking at requiring ground floor retail and entertainment uses along Stevens Creek, along North Wolf Road until you get to the Velco, uh, sorry, the, North, the Velco Parkway intersection with North Wolf Road, and then along Velco Parkway um, so that you have a double-sided retail street um, uh, across the street from the new building there. Um, the only other place that we'd actually require a certain program is along that western edge. We actually feel it would be a good idea to require a residential interface at least on the ground floor, um, maybe potentially on the upper floors as well, along that a, mo a majority of that western interface um, as it looks toward that, the Blaney neighborhood. Um, other than that, um, we actually feel based on the desire to create this vibrant, walkable environment that it's going to be pretty open in terms of where additional ground floor retail goes, um, where uh, there might be ground floor residential and where the upper floors would be office or residential. We actually feel that it's, an, it's, a, it's a, not a bad thing to let the developer and their team decide the, the best viable locations as long as you create this framework and regulate it predictably. This is the last section I just wanted to talk specifically because we did spend quite a bit of time on this transition on the western edge because we know this is, a, is of real interest to the community. Um, we studied it first of all in this physical model, and we also studied it, studied it in a digital model. And um, you know, 
I think we, I don't think there's anybody that wouldn't agree that one long building along that western edge is going to be too much, right? But that's the starting point. Um, the, the second sort of version is, well, even if you add bay windows, some ups and downs on that building, and some ins and outs on that building, the building's just going to be too large if it's one building. And so what we're saying is along that western edge is that we need to break this down into a series of buildings as a starting point. But in addition to that, right, that's, it, it, as we were looking at the sizes in the models, we're saying, hey, it makes a lot of sense to, even within those individual buildings, to be thinking about, do you have the entire length of that one building or just the wings of that building sort of stretching out to that western side? And so what all these letters represent are all the different aspects of the massing and the scale that we will regulate within the specific plan to ensure a good transition in scale to the western, to the, to the west side of the project area. So you'll see more of that as we move forward. So we studied uh, a number of different versions here uh, with this, using this base drawing that you saw at the first charrette, thinking about you know, breaking, sort of punching through the building and, and breaking down the massing in that way sort of pushing the, the, the articulation back on the, the upper, the third floor, fourth floor of the buildings, um, a two-story punch through versus a one-story. And we, we just studied, the point here is we studied a lot of different alternatives. And even we studied, so what if there was a three-story uh, sort of required at the street edge, but then it stepped back and you actually had a, then got a five-story piece um, that would not be visible from that street level side. So we're thinking about a lot of these alternatives and we'll come back with some, some very specific recommendations on that. So um, I appreciate your patience as I made my way through that content. I'm now gonna hand it off to um, Ben Siegman from EPS. He's gonna talk uh, briefly about, um, uh, he, uh, about some of the thoughts he shared about the, the feasibility he uh, produced prior to the charrette, and um, then we'll all be available afterward once again to discuss each of our pieces, Ben. So, it, so basically you can assume a 15, 15 to 20 foot base, so let's just say it's 20 for you to sake, so then, then you can add up a 10 foot tall story to get to that height. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'll hand it off to Ben. All right. Thank you, Dan. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming out Thursday night. Um, I just want to take a moment to say how much I appreciate Dan and Mitali and Bill's work, um, the rest of the Opticos team. They, the amount of progress you've made since Monday night is, is tremendous. I'm just blown away. The, the hardest working team in planning. And, and also these guys are on a first name basis with pretty much anyone who cares about this site. So I've just been tremendously impressed. Um, as, uh, as Dan indicated, I'm, I'm pretty much going to rehash what I said on Monday. All of it is um, on the city's website in terms of video and more numbers. I, 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 didn't, I didn't do as much work on this this week. So um, we'll just kind of, we'll just see, uh, hopefully I can do it quick and I'll be here afterwards to answer some questions. Um, on Monday night, I did start off by making, I think, a very important point. We all have to recognize that uh, Sand Hill uh, has paid a lot of money for this site, and that means that it's gonna have to be, to be financially feasible, a pretty sizable project. And the program that Dan has laid out earlier, it's about in the range of five and a half million square feet. And, and what so I think we're really talking about, if we wanna have an economically viable plan here, is the right trade-offs. And so we're talking about the uses on the site, and the types of community benefits that might come along with the project. And, th and that's really where I think the action is now, and we're hopeful that the conversation can really focus. And, you know, I think Dan and Opticos, they're really laying out just a tremendous number of things for us to all think about. And they're not saying any one of these options is the right option. Different types of public spaces and programming for public spaces and the way the retail might work. All this is just, we're trying to elicit some feedback, but. I don't, you know, I think that we're, we're getting closer, which is good. We're sort of coming through this funnel and people are sort of coming together and, and I think that's great. So the, um, the program that we're looking at, we did two tests based on some Opticos runs of, of what can fit on the site. It's about 2,600 to 3,200 housing units. Across all our scenarios, we're assuming 20% below market rate housing, which is five percentage points higher than the city's base policy. We are running low and, and very low income units on those. The, the office range is about 750,000 to 1.5 million. Um, we think that captures sort of the low end of what might be possible if you include a lot of other really valuable uses along with it. 
uh, all the way up to the, um, the sort of magnitude of office program that, that I think the applicant would, would like to have. Um, retail, we're looking at 400 to 600,000 square feet. I think, as Dan said, even at 400, you're going to have a vibrant retail area. I, I don't think that you're going to fall feel wanting for, for more street life or anything at 400. And I, I think, as we said when we did our brown bag on, on retail, um, we have some concerns about filling up all that space. And I was just meeting with developers active in the Bay Area today, different site, but similarly affluent and uh, population rich community. And they've spent about a year trying to market a really, really attractive retail opportunity. And they can, they have uh, upwards of 900,000 square feet that they might build on this site, but they can only do three because that's all the market can, that's all they can fill right now. And they've spent a year beating the street trying to find retailers. And that includes, you know, gyms and large format restaurants and all sorts of things, you know, not just uh, soft goods. So I just wanted to echo that. In terms of the other elements that are in all the runs we did, uh, we included a five acre park and all the sort of build out of that. About 85% of the parking would be subterranean in the schemes we tested, which keeps it out of sight and allows for uh, more building space at lower heights. And then this uh, civic use, and, and we've sort of thought of it as a, a town hall, city hall, 65,000 square feet in a kind of office format. It's a $50 million ask. So just in terms of thinking about the trade-offs here, it's, it's a lot of money that we'd be putting into that if that is what the community wants. Um, so let me kind of click ahead here. I just want to give you sort of the quick 101 real estate economics. How do we think about whether or not something pencils, whether it's financially viable? Um, we have to determine what the market would pay for the final product, how much a condo would sell for, how much an institutional investment um, entity would pay for a rental housing project, how much a retail REIT might buy a, a, a shopping center for, that kind of thing. That's the market value. And then we start to think about, well, what does it take to bring that product to market? You have to develop it, soft costs and hard costs, soft costs to your architecture, engineering, permits, fees, so on and so forth, everything that goes into to getting uh, the project planned. And then you actually have to build it, what we call hard construction costs. So those are all your laborers out there, all the goods and, and services that go into building a building. You also have to bring the land. And so all those cost elements, after we deduct them from market value, uh, if there's anything left, we've got a viable project. If it's negative, nobody's going to do it. Um, and, and what I did forget to mention, too, is, of course, you have to motivate the money with a re return on investment here. We're being very conservative. We're not assuming these folks are going to make a ton of money. We're saying 12 percent, what we call cash on cost. So just in a simple world, 12 percent um, and nothing more. And, and everything else would flow to this bottom line. Okay, so this is what I'm calling the trade-off slide. I just want to jump to it. In, the, in Monday's slides, we went through all the different products, what we think the market might be willing to pay for them, what we think it takes to uh, bring them to market in terms of cost, including hard costs, soft costs, and this developer return. Here, uh, what we're looking at is this sort of, this, this trade-off, that some things bring value, what, as I say, to, to the land, and uh, some things don't. And, here, these, these are sort of market values minus all the costs it takes to get to this, this, um, this building type on a per square foot basis. So for every building foot you build, um, this, is, this is what is sort of left after you deliver it and take away all the costs it takes to get there. And we're not even counting yet in this any of the land costs or these horizontal development costs, okay? So the roads, water, sewer, utilities, all this stuff. But it, what it does is it gives you a sense uh, that some things are highly valuable to build and some things not so much. So we think the office, as Dan indicated earlier, is the most valuable use to bring to this site. And so it's, it, it's no wonder that that's, uh, you know, why we see the, the programs that have more office performing better and with the ability likely to bring significantly more community benefits. And that might be more affordable housing, it might be this civic center, um, uh, town hall use, um, or, or other type of amenity. Um, we do think housing can bring some, some value to the land, uh, but it's not as much. And um, we think, you, so you're gonna need more physical space to create the value necessary for the project or trade off some of the community benefits if that's the way you go. Um, and the retail. We do think it's possible to make some money on some retail, 
But it's important to note that the, some of the larger format retailers that actually drive activity to the site, like a, uh, you know, a bowling alley or an ice skating rink, if those are be, to be retained, they're not likely to create a lot of value for the project. They're actually going to probably have to be cross-subsidized by other uses. So in a way, it's a, it may be important to the project to get the people on the ground to make it vibrant, but it, it, it's, um, it's some, something that should be considered as part of the trade-offs. And then on the hotel, we think it's likely a longer-term opportunity. Um, and that it, it can drive a little bit of value, but it's not a tremendous generator of value for the project. And so I'll be here after to, to sort of, you know, have conversation with folks about the economics. I don't want anyone to, to sort of let these numbers become gospel. Everything is still moving. We're looking at different building types. We're still looking at different infrastructure programs. So th this is just a I just want you to have a sense of the trade-offs for now. Um, these numbers will settle down. You'll see more detail over time. But this, this is, I think, is a good way to start thinking about what's important to you in this program and the fact that if you, if you want it to happen, you have to look towards some of the positives in this table along with fewer of the negatives to make it all work. All right, thank you. So I think this is the first charrette ever where we've had two bends on the program. I'm sorry, two segments. Um, one bend, two segments. But I'm, yes, different spelling. I'm Patrick Sigman of Sigman and Associates. Um, no relation. So I want to talk to you a bit about transportation and parking and transportation demand management, often called TDM, um, which is basically how to reduce traffic. Um, and it's also not parking. So you can think of it as parking and not parking. And so let's start by talking a bit about streets. And I, the way I always try to think of it is when I'm working on a, a downtown or a, a place where you want to create a new town center, a new downtown, is what is the experience of a pedestrian standing on the sidewalk? All too often as transportation planners, it's easy to get into designing as if you were in a helicopter, looking down and you know, thinking about only how the traffic moves. Um, this actually is uh, downtown Hayward. And this is a brand new street and a brand new park on either side of it. Uh, so, you know, you, you have a lot of things there that are good. You have banners. You have pedestrian-friendly street lights. You have a 25-mile-per-hour speed limit. You have um, sidewalk. Um, and you have open space on either side, about two acres, actually, and that that block, Full Acre. But unfortunately, um, that street got designed under the old Caltrans Highway design manual standards. Um, and it's kind of a 50 mile per hour design entering a, what was once a great little walkable downtown. So what we tried to do instead this week, as we have throughout our practice, is to look instead at just a lot of our favorite places that have been economically successful and beautiful and full of people who like to go there when they have many choices all around the region for a long, long time. So this is my hometown, downtown Palo Alto, Bryant Street. Um, you know, this can be done in a more modernist style of architecture. It can be done in this Spanish mission revival as it was in the 1920s. Um, but some of the things Dan talked about are what really makes it up. And so we really tried to pick those time-tested dimensions to lay out streets. And so some of the key things, well, actually, let me go back. First of all, to take the measure of these historic precedent streets and the squares and really know the dimensions and then use those to craft regulations. We'll have quite a bit of flexibility in the plan for dimensions of certain streets. So for example, the sidewalk might be um, smaller in front of a residential block, larger in front of a retail block where you need set sidewalk cafes and shopping. Um, but we will have minimum standards and minimum required elements. One really important thing that we've all too often left out is actually making bicycling safe for children from eight to 80 so that kids ought to be able to have the experience today that I had in the 1970s where when I was eight, I could ride to school. Actually, I could ride anywhere in Palo Alto or on the Stanford campus. Um, and my dad was 
and mom were comfortable having me do that. Um, so you can do it with temporary materials like a this street remake in Seattle. Or you can do it the way the Dutch do it. So you see there what you have is sidewalk on the right in front of some, some apartment buildings. Then um, at a slightly lower level, you have the um, place to bicycle, the protected bicycle lane, um, often wide enough for um, two people to ride side by side. Um, it's a really wonderful experience to be able to go out to dinner and ride comfortably with nobody honking at you side by side with your loved ones. Um, and then come the space for the street trees and car doors to open. Then comes the parked cars. And you know, we think that this design is going to be something that would work really well for the internal streets within this plan area. Um, because while most of the parking is likely to be underground or in parking structures, um, the, the uh, surface parking is likely to be short-term convenience parking, and also a lot of it will actually just be loading space to accommodate things like people who are using Lyft or Uber to um, come to dinner or to go shopping um, or you know, perhaps going out for a drink with their friends. And so um, we want to use this kind of approach because that way you can have comfortable cycling and be with your kid, and yet there's really active picking up and dropping off at the curb. And so that leads into um, the retail street framework. I apologize if some of this is, is hard to read. Uh, we finished these about two hours ago, and, and um, so they are um, printed out here on the board, and I'll be happy to speak to them, answer questions about them. But what you see here is just a, what might be a typical retail street within the heart of the, of the plan area. Um, dimensions pretty similar to the Bryant Street uh, example that I showed you a few slides ago, except here we've added the protected bicycle lanes. Um, the, um, here's a typical residential street, which I think on this slide probably looks very similar. The difference actually is that um, in this particular example, we um, shrank the required sidewalk width, the required pavement, down to about eight feet, and then we used that extra space to make the uh, tree lawn the, you know, the planting strip for street trees, um, considerably wider. Then for Stevens Creek, um, one of the things we know is that in, in the long range transportation plan for both the Valley Transportation Authority, which is of course the regional uh, bus and rail provider, um, and also I believe in, in city general plan goals, is to make Stevens Creek into a bus rapid transit line. So basically that is, the, uh, fast, frequent, reliable transit with signal priority usually, often with an exclusive lane. It essentially is designed to give you the experience of light rail but on rubber tires. So in order to do that, um, the, we, we drafted a conceptual design. The project is far off in the future likely, um, but we wanted to make sure we were allowing for it if and when it comes. Um, and so what we showed here is an example similar to the bus rapid transit being built right now on Van Ness in San Francisco, which is um, you run the bus lanes um, down adjacent in the center of the street, adjacent to the median. Then you put stations in the median. There's one planned right here at the project site, or at, I'm sorry, at the plan area at, at Wolf and Stevens Creek. Um, you, you then um, have level boarding so you can roll right on and off in a wheelchair right there in, in the median. You use the crosswalk at the signal to get out there. Um, and so we would expand the median to about 20 feet. Um, we then have room left for two traffic lanes in each direction, um, which should be ample for the 26,000 cars a day that are out there now um, and will allow for future growth. Then we retain the existing street trees. I, I'm sorry, the, the existing double LA of ash trees that are between the Valco parking lot and Stevens Creek right now. Um, and then to the north of that, close to the buildings, we would have room then for the protected bike lane and for a really generous 20 foot sidewalk. Um, one thing I wanna mention when it comes to traffic is um, last time I checked, the section of University Avenue in Palo Alto that goes between the 101 freeway and downtown through a beautiful residential stretch uh, that actually, I, 
carries 26,000 cars a day. So actually, what you have out there now on six lanes is the equivalent of a very busy two lanes. So I think it'll work pretty well with four lanes. Then um, this is Wolf Road, um, just north of Valco Parkway, looking north. And here again, we sought to retain the existing ash trees, um, and uh, uh, particularly the, the big ones on the right. Um, the idea here is that we create a multi-way boulevard. And if you've, if you've been to Paris, you've probably seen some of these multi-way boulevards. If you've been to places where Frederick Law Olmsted did some of his greatest boulevard um, plans connecting uh, different parks, places like Buffalo and, and uh, New York City, you've seen them as well. The idea is you have in the center the um, through lanes designed primarily for people who just want to pass by. So those lanes move a bit faster, but still at a stately pace. But then on each side, you add a smaller side drive. So that's a road with one lane of traffic, um, a single parking and loading lane. Um, and these realms are broken up by medians between the faster moving central traffic and the slower moving side drive. A um, Couple examples locally, there's the uh, Octavia Boulevard in San Francisco where we took down the elevated freeway. Um, actually, also if you go to Chico, the Esplanade is a great example. And so this kind of environment creates a very hospitable, uh, hospitable environment, both for pickup and drop off in that, that very tight, slow moving um, side drive. But what it also does is it actually creates an environment where retailers and restaurateurs actually want to open their doors and windows and, and face onto a big street like, like Wolf. Um, so then the other thing is to have a traffic reduction strategy. And you know, I, I was thinking just the other day about why is it that we have um, so many cars out there on the streets? And one thing that occurred to me is, you know, when my, when my mom and dad um, bought their first house in Palo Alto in the late 1950s, my dad told me that it was about $16,000. And yeah, and at the time it cost 10 cents an hour to park at the meters in downtown Palo Alto. Well today, if I could afford it, it would be a $2 million house, same house, um, but it's free to park in downtown Palo Alto at the meters on the street, right? So in the space of a generation, we have completely solved our affordable housing problem for our cars, right? <laughs> so, so basically, it's no wonder, it's no wonder that we have too many cars choking the streets and not, not enough housing. So we want to turn that around, and you can do that and reduce traffic at the same time with a bunch of techniques. So um, first of all, in the traffic reduction strategy, um, some of the words that, that aren't quite appearing here, um, I want to highlight. So first, when you do traffic reduction and you put it into a plan like this, you can either require that the future occupants of the buildings who move in and the developer of the site um, make a, a certain number of required efforts. For example, you, you require them to provide bicycle racks is a very simple one. Um, but also you can require them to do things like um, do what Genentech does, which is to provide $4 a day to every employee who does not park on that day. If, so if they get to their work without using a car, they get $4 a day. Um, then the other way that you can do it is you can do required results. So for example, at Apple Park, um, the requirement is that at least 34% of the employees have to arrive um, without bringing a car. And if that result is not achieved, then there's a penalty. So what I would recommend is that in this plan, we require both effort and results. And the idea is you can say, okay, these are reasonable efforts um, that serve as a baseline. We also have a, a goal that we want you to achieve, and I would recommend that it should be at least as strong as at Apple Park. That's entirely reasonable. Um, actually, that's a fairly modest goal compared to some other communities near, nearby in the Bay Area. Um, and so with that framework in mind, let me describe some of the things that we think um, would be good things to require when it comes to effort. And let me say this is entirely doable. When, when I began as a transportation planner at Stanford in 1994, uh, we had an 80% drive-alone rate. We had a requirement that we produce 
um, all our development with no increase in motor vehicle trips at rush hour. Today, Stanford has a drive alone rate of 40%, and yet, people still seem to really want to enroll there. So it's not like it deters uh, good people from, from coming. Um, this is a, a results from Genentech. In 2005, I worked with my colleagues on their plan. Um, we discovered that first of all, the parking regulations said you had to build more than one parking space for every employee as a minimum. And then their transportation demand management ordinance in town said you had to strive to reach a goal of, I think it was 35% or 40% of employees not driving alone. So it was like, oh, so we have to spend tens of millions of dollars building new parking structures, and then we have to spend more money to persuade employees not to use them. We and the city staff agreed, okay, that doesn't make sense. So we put together a plan where they agreed to let us build a lot less parking in return Genentech committed to a, to a really serious traffic reduction program and a goal. And we got from uh, 2006 to 2012, we went from 20% of employees using alternatives to driving alone at their campus in South San Francisco. By 2012, it was 40% walking or biking or taking transit or carpooling or vanpooling. Um, uh, today, uh, last time I checked in 2014, it's, it was at 43%. So ways to do this. Well, first of all, I recommend requiring parking uh, strategies be Im that reduce traffic be implemented. And that's because it's a really powerful lever. And the first thing to make this work is that we have to protect the nearby residential neighborhoods from spillover parking. So um, I, I think uh, I will, I'll have to talk through these without the benefit of some of the uh, words popping up, but bear with me. The, um, so the first thing is, um, we will um, need to first provide residential parking permit programs to protect residents from spillover um, at, at any neighborhoods that want it. Anywhere where a majority of the neighbors on the block would like to have it is usually how we recommend it. And then require that the new development pay for it. So for example, Kaiser Hospital in Oakland did this when they did their expansion. It's a low cost thing and it protects the neighbors. That allows you then um, to implement more ambitious strategies. So one thing that's really important to look like at is, first of all, what is the cost per parking space um, to build a new structured parking space? Turns out these days in Silicon Valley, it's about $50,000 per space gained. And that's for above ground parking structures. If you go one level down, underground, it's about 75,000 per space. You go two levels down, that second level will cost you about 100000 So there's a lot of money involved in this. So what does it cost to break even on the cost of a $50,000 parking space? It's about $335 a month. So the corollary here that's relevant is that anything we can do to s reduce the number of parking spaces needed is worth about $335 a month per space saved. So if you help an employee bike to work, you can save a lot of money. And that is how we fund a lot of these traffic reduction efforts. So one thing we can do is to require that the cost of parking at a residence, whether it's an apartment or condominium, that the, that cost be separated from the cost of actually renting or buying an apartment. Um, so it's a technique called unbundling the cost of parking from the cost of the residence. Um, so Gaia, uh, the Gaia building in Berkeley is one early example. Um, what they did at that building is they required the separation of parking costs so that you could save money by choosing to own one car or no car. Um, they required about $150 a month minimum charge per space. What happens in the market is the apartment winds up renting for substantially less. Um, and they also required that there be on-site car share cars. They required, um, in, in addition, you know, good bicycle facilities. The result was they had 91 apartments, as well as ground floor theater, penthouse office space. Um, they added 42 parking spaces. Here's what they got. 237 adult residents, 20 cars parked. Now here at Cupertino, you won't achieve results as good as that because 
The transit here is not as good by any, any stretch, um, but the principle's the same. So this can also be done for office buildings. So um, this is Bellevue, Washington. Bellevue, Washington required that the minimum charge for parking, um, I'm sorry, the, the minimum cost of, of uh, leasing off, uh, parking at office buildings be twice the, the rate for a bus pass. So the minimum um, that a building owner can charge for parking to the tenants is about $144 a month currently. So the way this works out is that tenants can now save money by helping their employees get to work without driving. So what a lot of the tenants do is they say, okay, if you're an employee, you can have $144 a month in cash if you walk or bike or carpool or take transit. Um, then when the employee takes that cash, the em employer simply rents fewer parking spaces from the owner of the office building. So um, what they've uh, been able to achieve there is the drive alone rate went from about 81% driving alone in downtown Bellevue before when they were a sleepy bedroom suburb. Once they built their downtown and put in these requirements, the drive alone rate dropped to about 55%. We can also require parking cash out for employees. So that's what we did at Genentech, um, requiring that employers offer the cash value of the parking space to employees who don't drive. Um, that is, again, a really powerful tool. What we've seen is that at places that offer about $165 a month to people who don't drive, you get about 30% reduction in the number of employees who drive to work. So it's a, a, a really powerful measure. And then requiring the provision of better transportation choices for people. So the parking side is, is one important lever, but we also need to pro provide more options. So um, requiring the provision of on-site car sharing spaces is another really good way. Um, it, it becomes financially viable when we do all of the parking strategies that we talked about earlier, because now, for example, if you if you're a renter and you don't bother with owning a car, now whenever you need to grab a car, you, you have one available. I have about 100 of these within a five minute walk of my apartment in, in San Francisco. Um, so for example, for this charrette, I got a car share car for four days, I loaded it up, I came on down. Um, and you can bring these to the suburbs even at the early stage. So for example, when I worked on the Packard Foundation headquarters, uh, the Packard Foundation called Zipcar, said we want two cars on site. Zipcar said, sure, you just have to provide us with a revenue guarantee so that even if you don't use them very much, we still get enough money to cover our costs. Um, and that's um, how that's been able to work. You can also require the provision of bike share bikes, like these Bay Area bike share bikes shown here in, in San Francisco, so that you can just grab a bike from a pod on the street and uh, uh, ride wherever you want. And then, of course, electric bike share bikes are now available, and we'd recommend requiring those as well, especially for you know, a hot summer day in Cupertino. And then another really good measure is to require the provision of free transit passes to employees and residents. And it's another measure that we've uh, required in places like downtown Berkeley, downtown Oakland. Um, the way Boulder does it is that they actually made a deal with um, the regional transit agency where they said, okay, we will pay a heavily discounted fee for every single employee who works in downtown uh, Boulder. About 10,000 employees at more than 800 downtown businesses. Um, what happened there is they were able then um, to use some parking meter revenues to fund the whole program. And um, they saved about 1,000 uh, employee parking spaces. Basically, they, they moved about 1,000 employees uh, out of driving. Um, and actually, that, more than, that savings more than paid for the cost of the whole program. So they got less traffic and they got more customer parking available. Um, so there are the results. Their drive alone rates in downtown Boulder went from 56% down to 36%. Another thing is that you know, we're actually in this 21st century where self-driving vehicles are actually out there on the road today. Um, 
This shuttle went into service at University of Michigan, running on public streets. It has no steering wheel, no brake pedal, no accelerator. It does have an, an operator whose only role is to basically welcome people, uh, reassure them, and there's a big red stop button he can press. Um, but what this means is, um, right now these are still as expensive as, as a regular shuttle, maybe a, a bit more. But because about 80% of the cost of operating a shuttle service is the driver, as the price comes down on this and they go into mass production, what this means is that we're going to be able to run shuttles at about a quarter of the cost currently, which means we can run service four times as often. So instead of having a bus that comes once every 20 minutes, now we can run a much smaller electric bus that comes once every five minutes. And that's what's starting to happen. So for example, we could require free community shuttles that come from uh, this plan area to destinations like Caltrain, but also to other destinations, schools, and so on. Um, this is one actually that runs on public streets in downtown Las Vegas. Um, there's a summary, um, which uh, will show up here in black on black font. I apologize for that. <laughs> as, as, you might, uh, as you might have noticed, we um, had a little technical trouble in putting these slides together, merging Dan and my slides, so I apologize for that. However, what these slides say is summarize the last 10 slides I showed you. So these are the strategies. Um, I'm happy to talk with all of you about them, and thanks for your attention. Thanks, Ben and Patrick. A couple of concluding thoughts before we can split out and, and have a conversation with you is um, there's just a lot more details for us to dive down into. Um, obviously, we're just scraping the surface uh, with what we've uh, explored in the, the, the couple of charrettes compared to what ultimately needs to go into the specific plan document. But um, so that, that will be happening over the course of the next uh, several months as we, we work on the specific plan and the code document. Um, in terms of, of sort of some really uh, important milestone dates, um, in, in I guess just a little over a week and a half now, on June 4th, we're actually going to um, be participating in a city council work session um, related to this specific plan area. So that's uh, coming up soon, a really important milestone opportunity for the council uh, to discuss this and give some direction to the process. And then um, things are gonna unroll pretty quickly then. Right now we're targeting um, the end of, uh, end of July, uh, July 30th for the release of the, the complete public review draft of both the specific plan and the form-based code document. So it's gonna happen fairly, very quickly. Um, so those are, the, that, those are the most important dates to, to know. Um, I appreciate and just wanna thank you all for coming out tonight and coming out over the course of the, the last couple of charrettes. And uh, this, it's, it's been a, an enjoyable and a challenging process at the same time. Um, but um, uh, we do look forward to, to taking these thoughts and further thoughts that we, we gather with the, the city council and, the, and, and, and sort of more feedback that we get from you all and as we dive into the specific plan. So thank you for coming. We're gonna split up into different groups so you'll have the opportunity to ask uh, our individual team members questions, either just uh, general questions or questions related to some of the content. Thank you for coming.